But folks, I'm here on the couch. I like when I can give you a story where I can sit and talk to you instead of running around the table, picking up this and that and the other to show to you. This gets me a little more relaxed. I'm wearing my little glasses because I'm gonna need them. I'm gonna be reading something and by, see how to get the glare. So these I can put down on my nose and look out over the top of the glasses like grandpa used to do. So this is one of those gloomy days you wish you'd just stayed in bed. I've already had my afternoon nap. Forgot to eat lunch and I'm getting a little bit hungry. So you get you something to drink, sit back and relax. And we're gonna have a history lesson today. I just jump back and forth with my stories and I'm getting to where I can't keep up with what I have and haven't told. I should have started way back in the beginning so today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back in time. I'm going to tell you a history lesson. It's as much your history as it is mine. I'm going to tell you about my great-grandfather. Now, the most of this information came from my mother. But his name was George Washington Nevels. Well, you can add that up and figure out where he got his name. Because down through the descendancy, there were several George Washington Nevilles, all named after General Washington. From what I've read, some of them served in the military with George. It may have even been said one was with them, with George, when he threw the silver dollar across the Potomac. Well, actually it wasn't a silver dollar, it's a piece of slate, and it wasn't the Potomac, because the Potomac's a mile wide. But anyway, that's the story we've heard growing up about President Washington. Okay, my great-grandfather, he was a tall, slender man. I've seen his picture. He had long white beard and he had a head full of silvery white hair, nice head of hair. He was a well-to-do man. He owned a farm or they may have called it a plantation back then, 1,200 acres. Now, this was during the period of the Civil War. He married a lady named Mary Sutton. Now, what little I know about Mary is that she actually descends from the Cherokee Indian Sequoia. Now, I know you've all heard of Sequoia. Sequoia was the man who created the Cherokee Indian alphabet. You can go on the internet and you can read about him. So that's what you might call my claim to fame. Anyway, Mary and George had eight children. My grandmother was Matilda. I've always loved her name. Matilda died when my dad was a baby, so he, he never knew her as a mother. But every Christmas, great grandpa would call all the children in to receive their Christmas gift. Each child got a gift of a hundred dollars. Now, grandpa, had married twice. When Mary died, he remarried and they had 11 more children. You can add that up, 19 children. It just blows my mind to even think of 19 pairs of shoes, 19 winter coats before the kids can go to school, but that's how it was. But 
Grandpa had the money. He had the farm. He owned slaves. He had 20 slaves. At Christmas, my dad would walk 13 miles to receive his hundred dollars, which was his mother's share. Now, personally, he didn't have that much contact with his, with his grandfather. But what I want to tell you in terms of history, this man was thriving during the Civil War. 20 slaves he had. Now, what I want to do is read a letter to you. This is a long letter. Give me just a minute to bring it up. Here it is. I hope you don't mind listening because it's an interesting letter. I think you will, in I can't say enjoy it because it's an emotional letter. This letter was written by his oldest daughter, Martha, after the Civil War. Now, listen close. This is a portion of a letter written by Martha Nevels, daughter of George Washington Nevels. It was found many years after the death of my father's grandfather. At the outbreak, of the Civil War, George W. Nevels and his four older sons upheld the Union cause, notwithstanding the fact that the emancipation of slaves would mean the loss of much wealth to the Nevels family. George W. Nevels Sr. had 30 slaves set free by the war, and George W. Nevels Jr., that was him, and his two sisters had 20 slaves freed. But however, that was no object between the Nevilles and their duty. They believed that a man to be true to himself must be true to his fellow man and to his country. They also firmly believed that the division of this grand union meant the downfall of a nation and the crumbling of a great republic. When the voice of the nation called, they answered bravely and promptly. And of those four brothers who went gallantly to the front, only one ever came back to comfort the heart of a frail and declining mother. The others had been laid to rest with a soldier's honors. Now this is being written by Martha Neville's the daughter. Bishop Nevels, for the last 40 years, a Baptist preacher and living near Kansas City, Missouri, was the only one of the four who survived the war. He saw active service for three years in the 1st Tennessee Cavalry and was wounded three times, once seriously and twice slightly. Another time he was saved from death by a suspender buckle. A musket ball well spent struck the suspender buckle on the left side and fortunately was turned. The old man will tell you in a husky voice of the good old days before the war. And he will tell you of the horrors of the war and the three noble sons who went to the war never to return. They were good boys, he will add, and a tear will trickle down the old withered cheek. And let me go to the next page. Okay. Down on the farm stands an old gate. It stands there all alone, just the gate and two posts, like a monument to the sad, sweet memories of the past. The timbers are very rotten and can hardly hold together. He will pause, wait a minute, he will point to it with a trembling hand 
and in a husky shaking voice tell you that that is the last work that Garrett did on the farm before he joined the army. Garrett died at Shiloh, but the gate is still preserved on the old farm at home, a monument to the memory of one so beloved. She continues, two of the younger sons went through the Spanish-American War. Mr. Neville enjoys remarkable good health for a man of his age. I'm assuming he was nearing the age of 100 by this time. But his eyesight has been failing rapidly in the last few years. The fact grieves him very much as he always took a deep interest in public affairs and never failed to read his daily paper. Very few men were better informed on current events than Mr. Neville's, so long as he could read, see to read. He has always been a very active, energetic man, and no longer than a half dozen years ago, he looked personally after the interest of his big 1,200-acre farm, riding here and there on a sleek horse, giving direction to farmhand, and looking after the work in a way that would have done credit to a man many years younger. Since then, he has given up the superintending of the farm, owing to failing health and eyesight, and he recently divided most of the land among the younger children. For several years, he has held an annual reception for his children and grandchildren, at which time he presents each one of the children with a check for $100. And in case the parent is dead, the check is given to the grandchildren. As there are 11 living children and four of those who have passed away have left, their, left heirs to represent them, there are 15 such checks given at each reception. And that's the story that my great aunt wrote about my great grandfather. This is history, folks. No matter how much people of today want to change our history, they can't change history. It was what it was, whether we liked it or didn't like it. It was there, and we have to accept it. I had another great uncle who died at uh, Gettysburg. I don't know anything about his history, but I'm sure it very much the same as what I just read. I thought you would like to hear that because it's about the only history that goes back as far as the Revolutionary War, because my ancestors, when they got off the ship on the eastern coast of the 13 colonies, that's as far back as I can go with my family history. Maybe you can do better than that. And make sure that you preserve this history, write it down, save the pictures, Leave it for your children and your grandchildren. You can create some wonderful stories from your own family history. Now, we all like to think we may have come from royalty. I don't know. Who knows? But I do know that the Neville name in England was right up there, just beneath royalty. It was a big name in England. It was a big name in Virginia and West Virginia and South, uh, Southeast Tennessee. My great-grandfather established the Corinth Baptist Church. It's located at the forks of the road between Tennessee and Virginia line. I remember when I was 13 years old, I went to a family reunion there. 
It's a small church, just a little one-room church, the white building, two or three steps up the front, but it's still there and it's being used today. While I was at the reunion, there were several of us kids there and there was a man there who said, come on kid, follow me. Well, there was a creek beside the church and they had big, great big stones, you know, big flat stones. Oh, the creek was so clear. You crossed the creek on those stones and on the other side was a little building and it said, General Store. Well, the windows were boarded up, but the man unlocked the door and he took us kids inside. And it was an old general store. The canned goods on the shelves were dusty. Things had just been left as they were when the doors were locked. But he had an icy machine inside and he gave us all an icy. Well, now that was a big treat back in those days to have an icy and you didn't have to pay for it. There was the great big red Coca-Cola box. You know the kind I'm talking about. They filled it with a big square of ice and water and you reached down in that ice cold water and got the knee high or your Coca-Cola or seven up out of the box and by the time you found the one you wanted your hand was freezing I didn't know then that general store had been owned by my own grandfather and mama told me about it later that was the store where he made his living along with the big farm they had so I was getting a little bit of my own family history right there, not knowing that I was in my grandfather's general store that day. Uh, we went on up after the reunion was over and we got to see my mother's home place. This was a two or 300 acre farm down between two two hills. It was like this, and then there was a road in between, and there's a barn and a house. The barn was in Virginia, state line marked on a post, and the house was in Tennessee. We got to see the spring down below the house. Now, this was in October, and it was hot that day. But we walked through the bushes and the vines. Mama wanted us to see where the spring came down the hillside. We got back in there and I'm telling you, it was like 20 degrees cooler. We got to drink from that spring, the best drink you ever had. Good, clean spring water. So that's the only time I got to see my mother's home place. It was one of those houses that had the uh, dog trot. You know what a dog trot is. It's in the middle of the house. Got rooms on this side, rooms on this side. And that's where the dog hung out. But in her case, that's where grandma's swing hung. She would sit in the swing and watch the sun go down. In the afternoons, you'd see the sun going down behind the hills, and that was home for her. She had lived in that house raising her own 20 children. Now, actually, only 10 of them were hers. 10 of them, no, wait a minute. 12 of them were hers, and eight belonged to her second husband. Her first husband, was also in the Civil War. He went away, leaving her with my uncle Abram and my grandmother, Amanda. She was just about two years old when my grandfather went off to war. 
Well, actually, he was captured and they took him. The enemy soldiers would come across the fields and they could see them coming and they would raid the home, take anything of worth and the food. They always took the food. So there was my great-grandmother. No, my grandmother. She was the baby. And my great-grandmother trying to take care of two little ones. So it was when she felt that her husband had died in the Civil War, she remarried. And that's when she married the man with eight children. And she raised 20 children. That's how it was in those days, folks. That's history for you. The house that my grandparents lived in was my great-grandmother's house. My grandfather re, well, he didn't rebuild. He renovated the house. He added extra rooms. He put big fireplace in the, in the uh, dining room and the other fireplace faced the parlor. And at night, in the winter time, the kids would gather around his chair by the big open fireplace Grandma, grandmother would bring in the, uh, what kind of nuts? Hickory nuts. She'd put them in a little brown bag and she'd put them in the coals of the fire. And when they would heat up, they'd pop, they'd pop. And the kid got a kick out of that. But that's when grandpa would tell them history. He would tell them about their uncles and their grandfathers and their cousins going away to war. This was also the Civil War, the war that our country wants to change its history. The war that my great uncle died in at Gettysburg. You're not going to change that. He fought at Gettysburg. He died at Gettysburg. There was one time he was going through the countryside there at home, and he was captured by the enemy soldiers, and they were taking him away to Jonesville, Virginia, to prison. And Grandpa would tell the kids a story about it. his name was uh, Jesse Ben. Uncle Jesse Ben. On their way, they were going by horseback. They stopped at a creek and they bent down to get a drink of water. Now while while the other soldier was standing there waiting, my great uncle bent down to drink from the stream and when he did, he got hold of a good sized rock. He raised up from the stream and hit the enemy soldier in the head, knocked him out, and he ran from there, and he was 15 miles from home. So he escaped the enemy soldier. There are stories like that go on and on. My grandfather was five years old. He would tell my mother that while his uncles and his and pap was out in the fields, tending the gardens, growing the crops. You could see for miles, and they would put him as guard up on one of the gateposts, big stone gateposts. They'd set him up there, and they'd say, now you watch, and if you see any sign of anybody coming across the fields, you run and tell us. Well, he would sit there and he would tell my mother and her sisters and brothers. And then he would see signs of soldiers coming across the fields. They were coming toward the farm. He jumped down from that post and he ran as fast as he could. 
The soldiers are coming. The soldiers are coming. And so the men all threw down their tools and headed for the woods. They hid in the woods until the soldiers left. That's history, folks. That's Civil War history. So many things happen and our country is trying to deny these things. No, no. You keep in mind your family history is sacred to you and nothing can change it. Nobody can change it and you don't want to change it. So that gives you a little bit about the Revolutionary War, the American, uh, Spanish-American War. It was a short war that, that my uh, great uncles fought in. And maybe the next story I will tell you will be about the uh, flu epidemic, the 1918 influenza epidemic that killed about 600,000 Americans. Actually, I think it killed about a million Americans, a million, a million people. And my parents were among the patients. They suffered through the influenza epidemic. I'll tell you that story. I'll tell you about World War II. Don't know anything about Vietnam because there were no family members during Vietnam. But I think you will find my story about the flu epidemic and about the depression years and World War II. Very interesting. So you stay with me. Not only will you hear those stories, you're going to hear about some of the blunders I've made that I try to turn into a little comedy routine. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not. So, this is my story for today. It's a story of my family history. And I would like to have met some of those people. I would love to have known those people but I still have my written notes and the things my mother told me. She was able to tell me more than my dad was. My dad wouldn't talk about his family because he was the youngest and he was orphaned at the age of 13. He went to work. When he was 15, he got a job with El Nin Railroad. He had to lie about his age, because he wasn't old enough. But he told him he was 18, and he began working for the El Nin Railroad. And that was the beginning of his adult career at the age of 15. So, I hope you liked this story. It wasn't a good one, I know it wasn't, but it's history. We don't want to forget our history. So thank you for joining. I'm going to go fix me a chicken salad sandwich. It's leftover chicken salad and I have had my fill of candied grapes and they're good. I'll tell you, they're just like popcorn. You eat one, you've got to have another, but I've still got a few left and I'm going to eat those later this evening. Thank you for staying with me and listening to my stories. And please, please, please comment. Please let me know whether or not you approve of the things I'm telling you. Because that matters to me. I want to please you as much as I want to please myself. So, I'm going to let you go now. I've given you 30 minutes. Now I'm going to go eat. Bye-bye.